Right after I dropped out of high school and moved out of my parents' house, I needed work real bad. I'd have done pretty much anything for rent money about that time in my life, so I'm lucky, or unlucky depending on how you look at it, that the local cemetery needed employees. At first, the old timers who had been working there for 20 or 30 years just wondered why someone so young would ever want to be a grave digger. It was hard work, really bad on the lower back, but I soon adjusted and it turned out to be something more akin to a free gym membership than an actual job. I mean it. I got swole pretty fast, and if I'm honest, it only ever felt like work if the weather was bad or we had an actual funeral on site. Otherwise, it was just nice to be able to spend time outdoors. So the way our cemetery was set up was pretty simple. The majority of the grounds were just regular grave sites, all pretty much the same size and same price. But the northwest corner of the grounds was a private site that contained much larger plots. These were reserved for much wealthier families, and the local undertaker made a lot of cash from selling extravagant grave setups to them. I'm talking whole mausoleums, statues of angels, and stuff like that. We hardly ever visited that area of the site except for cleaning and maintenance duties, and those were never left to me. I didn't take it personally, but the older guys just didn't trust me with all the cleaning chemicals and whatnot that kept the marble and brass fixtures looking fresh, which is why it was so weird when I got a call one of my days off, asking me if I'd been up to that area recently. My boss was livid. I could hear it in his voice, and he pulled no punches when he asked me if I had been screwing around on the northwest plots. Of course, I told him no, that the last time I'd been up there was to watch one of the old timers using the marble cleaning chemical as part of my training, and that had been months back. He sighed, seemed confused and confounded, so I asked him what exactly the issue was. He replied that it could wait until the next time I was at work. I was worried, sure, but... I was pretty sure that I hadn't done anything wrong, not deliberately anyway, and especially nothing that involved the Northwest plots. A couple of days later when I rolled into work, the atmosphere was incredibly tense. I knew something fairly serious had happened. All I knew is that I wouldn't have to badger anyone to find out why. The boss man walked me out to the Northwest plot, silent the whole way, and I knew better than to open my mouth until I found out exactly what was going on. There was already a worker up in the plot, tending to one of the graves, and that's when my boss told me that if I had been hanging around the area, maybe during my lunch break, eating a few snacks among the opulent grave sites, now would be the time to tell him. I swore to God that I hadn't, that I knew better than to eat stuff near the graves, as I had been well informed it attracts wild animals that can in turn do damage to some of the resting places, and that's when he broke it down for me. Something had tried to dig up one of the freshly dug graves out in the northwest plots. He said something in particular and not someone, because we each had enough experience to recognize when a grave had been dug up by tools or by hand, or in this case, by claw. It was rough around the edges, obvious claw marks in the dirt as opposed to the straight lines carved out by a shovel. This was something in an emergency, I mean for obvious sanitary reasons, but for sentimental reasons too. If local families discovered that wild animals were trying to dig up their deceased relatives, there would be an uproar. Something had to be done, and quickly. A meeting was called among the grave diggers in attendance. As far as we knew, the mysterious digging had been taking place overnight, and was most likely undertaken by some kind of scavenger animal. A coyote, black bear, maybe even an escaped dog. The solution was obvious. Night watchmen would have to be present in the cemetery every night until the situation was resolved. And guess who was voluntold to be the night watchman for the first full week? You guessed it. The young guy. The new guy. Me. The only thing that made the proposal even vaguely attractive was the fact that anyone doing the night work would be paid double the regular rate, and I could definitely have done with the extra cash. First night of being on watch really sucked. All I had for company was a flask of strong coffee and a 22 pellet gun loaned to me by one of the other workers to take down any varmints. It was long, boring, and lonely, but once I adjusted my sleeping pattern, it got a little easier. Then, on the second to last night of my watchman duties, 
I was on a little foot patrol walking towards the northwest plot with a flashlight in my hand. And that's when I saw it. A flurry of frantic limbs digging at the earth. I could have shouted something, maybe even fired the twenty-two in the air to scare the animal away, but if I killed whatever critter was causing us so much trouble, I might be out of the extra pay, but at least I'd have my daytime life back. I crept up slowly, turning the flashlight off and sneaking stealthily towards the dark shape working away at the earth. I've hunted rabbits at night with my uncle before, so I figured I'd use the old flashlight technique to cause the animal to freeze for a second so I could take the killing shot. But when I did, when I aimed that powerful flashlight in the direction of the digging thing, I almost cried out in fear. It wasn't an animal at all. It was a human, crouched on all fours, digging away at the earth with his or her bare hands. I couldn't bring myself to aim the rifle. I was too shocked at what I was looking at, so all I did was start making as much noise as possible, telling them to get out of there, saying I'd call the cops if they didn't comply. They complied all right, but not out of fear. The look in that person's eyes was one of fury, pure anger that they'd been interrupted in their obscene little act. I swear if I hadn't had that rifle with me, if I hadn't the means to defend myself, that were obvious to them. I honestly don't know if I'd be here today to tell this story. Needless to say, the other workers didn't believe me in what I saw. Some of them told me they didn't doubt that I'd seen something, that they disputed what that thing was, and I get that, I really do, but still, I don't know what I saw. The police struggled to determine anything other than maybe a few boot footprints, but it really didn't lead to anything else as that individual ran far, far into the tree line beyond what I was capable of seeing. All I know is that it was definitely a person. For the longest time, I was a tombstone caretaker for a cemetery in rural Georgia. It was only a summertime job for a 16-year-old Nothing too crazy, just cleaning off the grime and build up dirt from off of the tombstones and stuff. Now to kind of set the scene a little, the cemetery included one building that housed bathrooms for the five caretakers employed by the cemetery, in addition to one small, simple mausoleum. Other than that, it was all just flat earth with tombstones littering the entire site. The whole place felt pretty cut off too, as... Surrounding the place were some of the densest forests in the entire state of Georgia. Naturally, because of the eerie surroundings, I was always a little bit more paranoid than maybe I should have been. That, and I watch a ton of horror movies and such, which I get as a terrible combo for someone working at a cemetery. So one night, I'm doing my rounds when I have to go into the small mausoleum. We had some of the wealthier families in the area entombed within, and it was my job to go in make sure all was neat and clean, making sure it met the standards of these uppity folks. I'm walking over to it, and right off the bat, I feel like something is off. I couldn't quite put my finger on it at first, just this general sense that I wasn't alone. That's about the time that I noticed candlelight coming from the small mausoleum. I was also pretty certain that I could hear voices coming from inside too, like younger voices, kids my age at the time. They were giggling and laughing, and it didn't sound particularly wholesome. Now, I hadn't seen anyone enter or leave the cemetery, but I also wasn't about to potentially take on a bunch of drunk teenagers on my own, as I definitely would have got my butt whooped. So I called the lone security officer on duty, the dude that does a few rounds on the lot. He was an older, retired cop, but he was definitely tough, and I knew he jumped at the chance to help me out. When the ex-cop finally turns up, we both go inside. It was empty, which made absolutely no sense as I'd literally just heard voices and stuff inside. And there were indeed lit candles inside, burning around one of the tombs, a tomb that had been opened up to reveal the remains of a child-sized skeleton. Nothing other than that was disturbed, but that was bad enough, mainly because the open tomb contained a rotten old child's doll, like the knitted kind. It was seriously disturbing to see that old thing, 
smiling away whilst lying hand in hand with an actual kid skeleton. Me and the security guard quickly got out of there, doing a lightning sweep of the grounds to try to at least get eyes on these sick idiots that desecrated that girl's final resting place. Neither of us saw a soul, which was more frustrating than it was scary, and after about a quarter of an hour, we met back at the mausoleum to set the girl's grave in order by sliding the stone tablet back on top of the tomb. When we stepped inside, the doll that was previously hand in hand with the dead girl was sitting on the other side of the mausoleum, like just sat there upright, with that same uneven smile stitched across her face. Whoever was messing with us had actually gone back to move that doll to taunt us. I quit the next day and never went back, not even to visit. Okay, so years ago my dad purchased a cemetery when I was in middle school, and I worked for him through high school graduation. I did yard work, mowing, weeding, tended to flower beds, etc., and aside from the occasional shadows seen out of the corner of my eye or hearing strange sounds, the cemetery was actually quite a peaceful little place. But the strangest is when you have a burial in the crypts. Basically, you dig down about five or six feet to expose a giant pair of stone slab doors. You pull the stone doors off and then drop down into a tiny, cold, dark room. These rooms can either fit two full-size coffins, four children's coffins, by far the hardest to deal with, or years and years worth of cremated remains. So back in the 50s and 60s, families would purchase one crypt and the entire family tree would be cremated and interred inside it. Some just put the cremated remains in it and closed it up, but others lit candles and leave mementos, flowers and souvenirs, pictures and stuff like that. It's really creepy opening up one of those things after like 50 plus years and finding all kinds of melted candles and old pictures of the deceased people inside. Not only that, but when you hop down in there enough times, eventually you have a weird realization that you are at the same level and completely surrounded by bodies. And that one day, inevitably, you're going to be joining them. Another time, my best friend and I were earning a little money over summer at the cemetery working as groundskeepers when we were juniors and seniors. It was easy money. We got paid five bucks an hour, mostly for edging or trimming and generally keeping the whole place nice and tidy. We raked a lot of leaves and dug a lot of holes that summer, but we also got to tear around the grounds in what was basically a souped-up golf cart with our tools in the back. There was a lot of dead flowers to dig up, not to mention a lot of empty liquor bottles, beer cans, and unfortunately on occasion, even some used condoms. There was a widow who left scribbled notes on her husband's grave, almost all of them completely illegible. Also a lot of sodden, stuffed animals left on the graves of children. It felt so wrong throwing that stuff in the trash, and take my word on it that it sucked even harder than digging holes. It was annoying to work in the rain, and... It rained often, but it was truly a gravy job, no puns intended. The creepiest thing I saw was one of the old-style baby dolls that had been left on a graveyard. Not inherently spooky, I know, but what creeped us out was the fact that it was badly burned, almost like someone had gone over it with a blowtorch or something. Not just that, either. It had what we discovered to be these big iron nails that had been driven into the spaces its eyes should have been. Probably just some local college kids playing a prank or something. Heck, it could have been my buddy, but he never admitted to it. It just really creeped me out to see that thing one early morning, when there wasn't another soul in sight. Having said that, there was something far, far worse I encountered while doing that job. It was the naked corpse of a young woman my age, left neatly with her arms at her sides one foggy Saturday morning. She had been strangled right there. Whoever murdered her had also bludgeoned her horribly. She was identified quickly, and it turned out that she was a student at a neighboring high school, but her clothes were never found, and to my knowledge, her murder was never, ever solved. My friend and I were grilled by police on two separate occasions, and honestly, I think that was the scariest part, knowing we were actually implicated in the murder. But we didn't know a thing, and each had alibis, so... Thankfully, we were eventually rolled out, and thankfully, 
the cops never bothered us anymore. I just pray that she's resting in peace. My name is Sarah. I'm 20 years old and I'm from North Carolina. Last November, exactly 101 years since the armistice of the Great War, my Penn State contemporary history class went to visit the Allied war graves over in France. I had never been out of the country before, not counting a small two-day trip up to Canada to see a cousin of mine who was studying in Toronto. So I was extremely excited to see a little of the world outside of the east coast of the U.S., I even learned a little French to be able to get by. Taking a few online lessons on basic conversation and asking directions, lessons I worked super hard at too. With every little word that I learned, every time I mastered the difficult pronunciations, I got a little bit more excited to the point where, when it was finally time to pack and drive out to the airport, I was positively shaking with anticipation. But when we arrived, it wasn't quite the... Parisian dream that I had envisioned. Aside from the weather being terrible, the French can be really, really rude to tourists, like unfathomably so. It made me realize how nice people can be in the US. Like sure, we can get a few jerks that are all like, speak English, this is America, but we certainly don't go around correcting minor mispronunciations, especially if it's a foreigner speaking English, which is exactly what some French people decided to do. I'd ask directions to the nearest patisserie and, and end up getting a 10 minute grammar lesson from some sour old lady, and she was actually one of the less rude ones. The really mean French people simply ignored me altogether or turned to say something like, I'm sorry, no English, even though I just asked them a question in passable French. After a while I got over how lame they were and it helped that there were a lot of nice French people who made up for all the jerks but I made up my mind to focus on the reason I was there in the first place, to enrich my knowledge of history with a plethora of physical visits and first-hand sources. So in a small quaint town called Sorangenel, my class visited a war cemetery dedicated to American servicemen who died defending mainland Europe from the German Kaiser's brutal war machine. In the Wazain American Cemetery, the remains of over 6,000 fallen soldiers are interred in a series of plots labeled A to D, under a blanket of iron-gray clouds, our group walked silently among the rows of pristine white crucifixes, each one representing an American who had ventured to Europe on some great modern crusade but had not lived to tell the tale. I saw a man in uniform, standing in a small patch of delicately pruned grass that showed no obvious markings of grave sites. This area was marked Plot E. Plot E was not mapped on the plastic notice board that depicted the locations of the grave sites. There were no mentions of it in the visitor's guide, no mentions of it in the English language pamphlets, nor any mention of it on the cemetery's website. It was as if the plot didn't exist at all. Officially, it didn't. As I walked solemnly toward the uniformed man, I noticed his fatigues were of the old kind, the same olive drab that was worn during the Second World War. I figured he must have been some kind of tour guide, a reenactor or something. Then I began to see them, all of the 96 white markers the size of index cards, carrying only a small ID number, no name, no place of birth, just simple little ID numbers that made them appear more like a subterranean filing cabinet more than anything else. Unlike the other plots, there were no stars and stripes flying, no indication that these were Americans and all. It was terribly sad, and I wondered why there was a complete lack of reverence to those graves. But I didn't have to wait long to find out. They're buried with their backs facing the other plots, the man solemnly said. But here, apart from the others, lie the dishonorable dead. He smirked at the look of confusion on my face. You as soldiers who happen to be dishonorably discharged by the military before their execution for other assault or murder of European civilians. Oh, uh, I see, and whose grave is this one? I quietly pointed down to the small white plaque at his feet. Ah, uh, this one. He smiled, but 
He couldn't hide the melancholic look in his gray eyes. This one belongs to a criminally inclined soldier who happened to be caught poaching on some rich English aristocrat's country estate. They were caught, an argument ensued, and the landowner received a single gunshot wound to the head. The murderer was a Pennsylvania man, his name, Georgie Smith. There he lies, like Corporal Clark and Private Guerra, over there, he said, gesturing to a pair of the small white markers, who savagely assaulted and strangled a 15-year-old girl while based in the UK, or Louis Till, a black soldier executed for his alleged involvement in the murder of an Italian woman. Louis Till, sir? The name seems so familiar, but for all the wrong reasons. That's right. Emmett's father. Hanged on foreign shores while his son was just three years old. A dark foreshadowing of his own death just eleven years later. I honestly couldn't believe what I was hearing. It was the very same Emmett Till whose mother gave him that open casket funeral to show the world how terribly her son had been treated in his final moments. How must she have felt knowing she lost her husband and son in the exact same way? A false accusation jumped upon which such violent zeal that her loved ones were taken away within moments of their supposed transgressions. How could she have coped with that? How could anyone have coped with that? It was exactly how the guy had phrased it. A foreshadowing. Like Emmett's death had been decided many years before, his fate entwined with that of his father's in the most hideous way possible. It's the most intensely creepy fact I've ever had to come to terms with, one that made me question my entire worldview, to wonder if there really is some sort of plan, God's plan, the devil's, whatever, for some people. Maybe, just maybe, there are people out there that really are just doomed. For as long as there have been people walking the earth, we have required a place to memorialize our dead. Whether it be the sky burials of the Native Americans or the fireship funerals of the Vikings, mankind has developed a series of complex ritualistic processes by which we process the loss of our loved ones. Not only that, but we have also found ourselves in need of a place to remember them, A modern age has brought us the burial and marker system that we often call cemeteries or graveyards. They are places shrouded in a deep sense of human mortality, places of profound reverence. One might even go so far as to call them outright sacred. A few find any real comfort in such a place and the natural association with death had led them to be a focal point of horror fiction, both past and present. So quite frankly, I can think of no worse place to meet a grisly end. The horrific irony of being murdered in a graveyard is one very few of us will have to endure. Yet for these two poor unfortunate souls, that's exactly the cruel fate that the Reaper served up to them. Such is the fate of Jessica Lynn Keene, a 15-year-old girl from Columbus, Ohio. Jessica was an exemplary student and a joy to be around according to friends. An honor student as a result of the hard work that she put into her schoolwork and a cheerleader as a result of the passion she brought to her extracurricular activities. However, as Jessica advanced steadily into her teenage years, her behavior began to change, and not just in the innocent, rebellious manner that most young people manifest at that time. Jessica became reckless, self-destructive, and worryingly wild. She quickly threw in the towel with regards to her cheerleading practice, She stopped hanging out with her regular friends. Teachers noticed her waning attentions in class, and naturally her grades plummeted as a result of her lack of focus. After some discussion, her parents decided that her poor behavior was a result of the boy she was seeing, an 18-year-old from central Ohio by the name of Sean Thompson. There is little doubt that Sean was a bad influence on the young Jessica, as he introduced her to alcohol and cigarettes, something the formerly outgoing girl had eschewed from her entire life. The pair regularly stayed out late together, attending rock shows and hanging around dive bars until they were kicked out for lack of ID. She came home later and later, drunker and drunker, 
until her school attendance was badly affected by her inability to get up in the mornings. Her parents despaired over their wayward daughter, trying and failing with every supposed solution they devised to set her back on the straight and narrow. In the end, they decided to take drastic action and placed her, very much against her will, in a home for troubled teens on the 4th of March, 1991. However, in light of the fact that she most definitely did not want to be there, Jessica quickly began to plot her escape from the girl's home. Then, one chilly March evening, she waited until the staff members' backs were turned before slipping out of the secure building, only a bag with a few meager belongings to her name. Her parents were livid with those responsible for her care, furious that they could be negligent enough to allow such an escape. They quickly got in touch with Ohio police, filing a missing persons report, expedited as a result of her status as a vulnerable young person. Police contacted Sean Thompson, Jessica's on-and-off boyfriend who lived a few hundred miles away. The pervading theory was that Jessica would somehow find her way back to central Ohio in order to reunite with Sean, but on their arrival, police discovered that not only was Jessica not present at the boy's home, but that he was completely unaware of her escape attempt. It was only then that Columbus PD realized how grave the situation was. Tragically, after being missing for merely two days, Jessica Keene's dead body was located at the rear of Foster Chapel Cemetery, just over 20 miles from the girl's home that she had been forcibly interred at. Jessica had been stripped, assaulted, and severely beaten. She was still wearing her ring and watch, but terrifyingly enough, a pendant that she wore with the word taken on it was nowhere to be found. In a horrendous twist of fate, her on and off again boyfriend was the prime suspect of her slaying, but early DNA testing technology proved he was not responsible. Columbus Police's main theory was that Jessica had escaped from the girls' school and, without any money to buy a bus ticket, attempted to hitch a ride along the route back to the city. It was then that a car had stopped and that two men had offered her a ride. Either Jessica had outright refused based on her perception of the driver and passenger, or had become suspicious of the men's intentions and changed her mind about wanting to ride with them. Whatever happened, a foot race had ensued, whereupon Jessica had attempted to escape her pursuers by running into the Foster Chapel Cemetery. Investigators discovered evidence in the cemetery that showed how Jessica had tried to hide behind gravestones. One of her socks was found, and a knee imprint in the mud behind a gravestone was found with or near the discarded sock. She was killed near a fence in the cemetery, presumably by her abductors, who had followed her. A cross with her name on it was placed where her body was discovered near the fence in the cemetery. On April 9, 2008, police in Burlington, North Carolina arrested Marvin Lee Smith Jr. based on DNA evidence. Smith was charged with unlawful intimate conduct on Jessica Keene, a felony, and was quickly extradited to Ohio to face the charges. Shockingly, in 2009, Smith admitted to a Madison County courtroom that he in fact had had his way and murdered Jessica. Smith told the court that Keene had escaped his car and ran into Foster Chapel Cemetery, where she collided with a fence post and fell. Smith said that he beat Keene to death with a tombstone, then discarded it over the fence nearby. Reports show that police had indeed found bloodied pieces of a tombstone where Smith had indicated. In exchange for his confession, Smith avoided a death penalty trial that was set for March 2009. He pleaded guilty to one charge of aggravated murder with specifications of defilement and was sentenced to 30 years to life in prison. We can only imagine the final terrifying moments of Jessica Lynn Keene's life, fatally pursued in a place where the concept of death is all pervading, only to be beaten to death with something that symbolizes our very impermanence. It seems the Grim Reaper has a sick sense of humor. I see there's been a call for creepy or unexplained stories centering around cemeteries. Well, I mostly definitely have something to offer in that regard. You see, I'm from Hong Kong and I work at Pok Fu Lam Cemetery, one of the most overcrowded burial grounds in the entire world. Constructed in 1882, 
The private Pok Fu Lam Cemetery on the western side of Hong Kong Island is an absolutely magnificent sight. Even having lived here all my life, its grandiosity is something that has never grown mundane for me. Built into the mountainside and terrace steps and interconnected with staircases, the cemetery resembles a giant outdoor amphitheater. My story starts just before the festival we call King Ming, also known as Tomb Sweeping Day. The festival in early April dates back 2,000 years to the Han Dynasty. On this day, families will visit their deceased relatives' grave sites to clean them. This is mainly a show of respect to our ancestors, to show how we keep them in our thoughts and prayers, but it is also a status thing, as a family with a clean and well-tended graves is the most worthy of prestige. And due to the extreme overcrowding at the cemetery, where some families can pay over $30,000 for the privilege of being buried there, some years we have to do a fair amount of work before the family visits commence, and sometimes this work is not pretty. So, last April I was given the job of moving some remains into newer grave sites to make room for those who had paid vast sums of money for the most attractive burial sites. It's something I'd never done before, and quite frankly I was actually dreading it. Cultural taboos of moving a person's remains aside, it was apparently some of the hardest, most grueling work for me or my colleagues we would ever have to do. Wrapped up in layers of protective equipment on some of the most humid days of the year, those charged with the task had to be meticulous to be able to move remains up and down hundreds of seats of stairs without losing so much as a speck of dust or bone. And so it came to be that one very early morning, I put on my mask, goggles, and forensic suit. We have a name for this in Cantonese, but this is the most accurate translation, and set about beginning my task. I worked eight hours straight on just breaking the grave seal. Since we have to move the entire grave along with the remains, every piece has to stay intact and undamaged. This is a very old and unkempt grave, too one which the family of the deceased had happily accepted money from a wealthier family for. With the cash injection resulting from this, they could afford to spruce the gravesite up a little, or maybe even keep the money for themselves. But that was unlikely. I could not even read the name on the headstone. It had been worn away by the elements over the years, so I was hoping the family would invest in making the grave look like a little more presentable. The next day came the time to actually start bagging up the remains, it was a painstaking process, collecting every individual bone after breaking through the rotten wooden coffin that housed the body. I came to realize that it's also a very hard task because you're faced with your own mortality. Yes, being around a cemetery all day, five days a week, makes you reflect on death, but our jobs are consumed with the banalities of maintenance and cleaning tasks, and so it's easy to distract oneself with smaller jobs so that the overall theme of death slips quietly into the background but it's not possible to compartmentalize so effectively when faced with another human's corpse. Picking through this long dead person's bones was horrific, singling out each little piece of them, placing the pieces into the relevant plastic bag. It was seeing a human being in their most basic pieces, like a broken down Lego set that would be impossible to reconstruct. It made me think of how fragile we are, how temporary and fleeting our lives are, Part of us do stick around long after we're dead, just not the pieces we want. Now I feel I need to preface this by saying that I don't believe in the supernatural or the paranormal. I know there is a perfectly rational explanation for what happened to me during this time, but it's an explanation that has thus far escaped me. You see, on the nights after I began performing these tasks, I began to have the strangest dreams. Ones in which I would be working in the cemetery only to be approached by a young woman who was apparently visiting her ancestors' graves. She was very beautiful, tall for a girl in Hong Kong, and chose to dress in a very traditional Chinese style instead of the western dress that seems to be much more popular here, especially among younger people such as myself. It was a very lucid dream, so lucid that when I awoke, I had the woman's name on my lips. Her name was Li Yan Kei and all the next day I couldn't stop thinking about the dream that I'd had about her. The dreams persisted for a few nights, departing and returning as the week dragged on, and I didn't really think anything of it until the time came to restore the engraving and the painting on the tombstone itself. 
we had to consult old handwritten databases to discover the name of the person interred in the particular plot. These were huge, thick tomes retrieved from the back of some dusty vault somewhere, and if it wasn't for the meticulous organization of these records, our job would have taken much, much longer to complete. Only when I came to the records of the remains I had been excavating, I thought I must have made some kind of mistake. The family's name, Lee, then the middle name, Jan, were the first words I read. Immediately, I thought of the reoccurring dream I'd been having, the one with the pretty girl saying hello as she visited her deceased relatives. I dreaded seeing the next word, desperately hoping it wouldn't be Kay. And thank God that it wasn't. It was Fawn. The deceased person I had been moving was named Lee Yan Fawn. But that wasn't enough to calm me down. It was still far too much of a coincidence that the family name and middle name of this dream girl and the dead person were exactly the same. The dream started to abate once the remains had been moved and the grave sealed up again. There were no more nightly visits from Lee Yan K. I still can't quite explain why I had those dreams, but I'm almost certain that it was just my way of processing the stressful, painstaking process of moving a once living person's remains. But even when I try to rationalize what happened, I never fail to be intensely creeped out and uncomfortable. Former funeral director here. A bit of a setup first. The cemetery I run is real old, like by a good few hundred years. At least it must be since the church next to it was constructed during the 17th century. Considering the fact that it is a pretty rural place as well, most people back in the day were buried with only wooden crosses and such, no stone or marble. So as time goes on, crosses rot and wither away, new people get buried, etc. Nowadays, due to less people living out here in the sticks, which means our budget is increasingly limited, the cemetery is really run down and overgrown. It is a really pretty place, and it's honestly pretty depressing. So as some of you can imagine, when you keep burying bodies in the same small patch of dirt for that many centuries, eventually the soil has been worked over dozens and dozens of times. So in the end, it consists of mainly bone meal. You can't even rake over the flower beds there without accidentally uncovering some teeth or finger bones or something equally grim. It's nothing but fragmented skeletons all the way down under the thin turf. The soil sort of resembles the kind of dirt you see near sandy beaches, except on closer examination all the light-colored parts are just bone fragments rather than crushed seashells. Not really scary or unexpected, just super eerie until you eventually get used to it. You learn to treat anything recognizable as human remains with respect and just tuck it away out of sight under the plant or whatever else you were putting there. Anyway, so someone was taking care of their relative's grave and decided to expand the area around the grave. For some reason, the people around her are not particularly fond of grass, rather preferring a well-leveled ground with zen garden lines made with a rake. The person removed the grass and was sprucing up the place with a rake when they pulled up a bunch of snow-white hair from the dirt. They must have just freaked out and ran out of there, leaving the cemetery attendant to stumble across what was essentially hair coming out of the ground. She reported it to the church and supposedly they reburied the remains. Even with all my years as an undertaker, I'm not entirely sure how there could have been a body so close to the surface, but there's another incident that sticks with me even more than that one. My business partner and I had just gotten back to the funeral home from a call for a 27-year-old woman who tragically passed away due to terminal cancer. As we were moving her body from the cot to an embalming table, we heard an audible click, and the radio across the room turned on full volume of static. It's one of those old radios you turn the volume dial until it clicks to turn it on. We both looked at each other, pale as ghosts. He happened to be extremely religious, and this event visibly shook him. He found an excuse to leave early, not long after the incident. So I shut the radio off as I typically use my iPhone to listen to music while doing embalming work. When I'd finished the procedure and was attempting to move her from the embalming table to a dressing table, I heard that click from the old radio and it turned on full volume yet again. 
At this point, I was fairly freaked out and got out of there not long after. My partner and I never spoke of it again, and nothing like that had ever occurred to my knowledge before or after. I spent a lot of time in a local cemetery. I know, it's weird, but it's a very old place, culturally significant, you might say. And sometimes it just suits my sensibilities to be around the dead rather than the living. One of the weirdest things about this particular cemetery to me is that there's a small section located a little bit off to the side that's filled with lots of really old graves, marked only by three-digit numbers. I'm not sure how many there are exactly, but if I recall correctly, I've seen the numbers go up past at least 300. Some of them have a little flag stuck into the ground near them, indicating that they're a veteran of foreign wars, yet no name or dates accompany the number. I never really figured out why they were just numbered and had no identity, but I guess it's just the bodies of people whose names they couldn't identify. Must be horrible to be lost to history like that, just a nameless grave. In roughly the same area, there's a grave that has no number but does have a name, dates of birth, and death and birthplace, but it's entirely in Greek. I once took the time to translate the letters using an app on my phone, and it revealed that they were born far away in Lacadia, Greece, and they share a last name and birthplace with another entirely Greek grave located all the way across the cemetery. Thing is, the birth dates are all different, varying from like 1900 to 1983, only the death date is all the same for each name. Hundreds of people died on the same day, and much like the nameless graves, I've never quite figured out the story of what happened there. Only I have actually researched it, despite Google turning up nothing. There was also a grave in one of the newer sections that has notes posted next to it from the wife of the man buried there. Not just one note either. On some days, there are hundreds of them, all these little post-it notes stuck all over the grave, most only bearing a few words of poorly scrawled writing on them. Almost like the woman of the man is continuously coming back to, like, running conversations with her dead husband. Or I suppose it could be a sister or something, and I suppose I'll never really find out. Also, I've seen things and felt things in my presence while I walked alone between graves. Quick caveat, I do not believe in ghosts. I describe myself as an agnostic person, I don't quite believe in the concept of God like a lot of people do, like it's dumb thinking that God is this giant bearded white dude, Santa Claus without the costume, some all-seeing all-knowing presence, but I do believe that there are things in this world that we cannot explain yet. Just like in years before when scientists didn't know why the sun appeared to move around the earth, only that it did. For example, on more than one occasion, I've been looking at a person's grave studying the intricately carved morbid designs when a bird had suddenly swooped down and landed either on the tombstone or on the grave itself. I've seen cats meowing and pawing at seemingly nothing, like staring intently at something that I'd apparently can't see at all. Again, I'm sure there's a perfectly rational explanation for this, but overthinking it during a graveyard walk can get pretty intense at times, let me tell you. I remember the night my father died like it was yesterday. I was literally about to leave my apartment, go to work in the bar I was the deputy manager of, finishing off an episode of The Sopranos when my phone started to ring. For some reason I got it into my head that it would be work calling, asking if I could come in earlier or some other nonsense reason. So I took my time to answer and when I did it was incredibly nonchalant. If I was pressed for a single emotion to sum up that moment, it was boredom but a boredom that really wasn't to last. The news hit like a freight train. He had died suddenly, unexpectedly, of some kind of blood clot in his brain. One moment he was healthy and happy, the next, he was announced dead on arrival. The funeral was rough. It sounds cruel to say, but I feel like if a relative is old or has some kind of terminal illness, at least the family and friends have time to prepare to ready themselves for the loss. But with us, we didn't have that time. It was like going zero to a hundred in seconds flat, bored to grief-stricken in the time it took to say, 
I have some bad news. So instead of this kind of unwilling acceptance that has characterized the funerals I've been to in the past, there was just this shell-shocked sense of loss, like everyone had taken this one-two punch and were walking around in a daze, unable to quit process the loss that we were feeling. I've never been big on visiting graves either. It sounds a bit callous, but what's the point? It's only ever to comfort the living. The dead don't know we do it, and quite frankly, I would want someone to remember me, sure, but some ritual visitation that brings up all these feelings of mortality and impermanence? Nah, just raise a beer glass for me, and that's all I want when I'm gone. But when it came to my dad, I had next to no closure whatsoever. So I ended up going against my own previously held convictions, scrambling for that sense of attachment, desperate to feel like he wasn't really gone. Weekly visits became monthly visits, all with the same routine. I drank a can of his favorite lager over his grave, talked to him a wee bit about what's going on in my life. It never made me really feel any better, but I could feel myself taking baby steps along the grief cycle each time I walked away. It was helping, in a small way, but it was still helping. So the little ritual played itself out in exactly the same way, until one day when I saw an unfamiliar man standing near to where he was buried. He was dressed entirely in black, a long coat with a similarly dark umbrella under his arm. It wasn't clear if the man was visiting my father's gravesite or simply one near to it, but as I walked closer, he caught sight of me. He quickly began to walk away from the gravestones and towards one of the cemetery exits. Nothing unusual about that, right? People are entitled to grieve in privacy, I get that. So I didn't really think anything of it. That was, until it happened all over again, in exactly the same way. I put it down to coincidence the second time around, but as the second time became a third time of seeing that same guy standing near the headstones, I started to think something weird was going on. That third time I tried to approach out of sight as quietly as possible. I wanted to figure out if he was really visiting my father's grave, not just one of those close to it. That's the time I realized he was. I watched from a distance as he knelt down near the headstone and touched it for a second. I didn't recognize him from the funeral and although I couldn't exactly see his face, I knew for certain that he wasn't someone I knew nor someone I'd met before even in passing. My curiosity got the better of me and I made up my mind to get to the bottom of whatever was happening. I kept my stealthy approach, staying light of foot and out of sight as I got closer and closer to the gravesite. But as I leveled with him, he turned, saw me, got this look of pure shock in his eyes, then actually started running in the opposite direction of me. I mean hurtling through the graves in the direction of an exit. I just sort of reacted and chased after him. It was that or face the possibility of never getting another chance. After such a confrontational approach, he might never visit my father's grave again, and for the second time, I would be left in the dark with no closure whatsoever. And there was not a single chance that I was going to let that happen again. And so that's how I came to be chasing a guy through a freaking cemetery, running full pelt, screaming at him to stop, how I just wanted to talk to him. The handful of other visitors looked on in a mix of shock and disgust, unable to quite believe how someone could be so disrespectful around the final resting places of so many of their loved ones. But if I'm honest, I really didn't care. I knew that if they were in my place, they'd be doing exactly the same thing. I caught up with the guy near one of the exits. I actually managed to grab hold of him by the arm at one point, pulling so that the guy was forced to spin around as a result of his own momentum. What I saw made me feel sick to my stomach. The face that I saw, barely covered by the black scarf anymore, was the face of my father. It was identical in every way, only the way he carried himself, minor perceptions of body language and stature, was much different than I remembered. When he spoke, it sent my head swimming. My father was from south of England and his accent reflected that, but this guy had a distinctly Scottish accent. At least, that's what it sounded like. It definitely wasn't my dad. 
He told me to leave him alone before he took off again, and God help me, I did. My legs were jelly, and not just from the burst of sprinting that my decidingly unathletic self had seemed to conjure up. I couldn't move. I couldn't bring myself to follow him. After a sit-down discussion with my mom, the only thing we can agree upon is that the man must have been my father's identical twin. She had seen his body after all, and she had identified him at the morgue, and there was no way that he had faked his own death, or any of the other overly paranoid things I initially suggested. But as my mom asserted, he had never ever mentioned having a brother, let alone a twin. It's something we're obviously going to look into, as if this guy is who he thinks he is. Some long-lost sibling of my dad's, then I'd really like to get in touch with him. Soon. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured in the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more... Grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, be sure that you don't tell anybody about the Triangle Earth Society. <laughs>